please welcome my guest today. Hey, bud. One and only Joe Testa. <laughs> hey, AKA man, how are you? The Fonz. I'm great, Joe. How are you, buddy? I'm good, but first I have to say, um, thanks a lot for making me be the follow-up to Vinny Caliuta. Like, what in the <laughs> world, dude? What are you doing to me? <laughs> you, you probably thought I was mad at you, right? You probably thought, yeah, what's, I'm, what's I'm thinking this, for? There's, there's something going, there's some underlying issue there. I, I, no, we, need to, no. we need to flesh this out. <laughs> no, Joe, I can tell you, just looking right now, you've got way more people watching than Vinny did. Vinny yeah. wishes he could have this many people. <laughs> <in the end. laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Uh, it's good How are you? Me, What's going? I'm you guys, uh, you still snowed up up there? Yeah, we uh, we got we got hammered on Saturday. We got two twenty, I think, twenty seven inches here in Cohasset along the water. We got most of the towns got beaten up pretty badly. So, yeah, yeah. but Almost. it's forty something today, so it's melting. Nice, very nice. Yeah, you, you remember what the snow is like, Joe? You're no stranger to snow. I, 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 I that is correct. <laughs> Is it, is it public knowledge to, for people to know where you are now? Um, I'm not, it's not private or anything. I mean, you know, I'm in Florida. It's 82 degrees today. So oh, bastard. I'm yeah. going to, it's my show. I can swear you bastard. <laughs> don't let your kids watch this. Don't, don't let them watch this. We don't okay. Them All right. Oh, that's great, man. Good for you. Good for yeah. you. Well, thanks for being here, buddy. Thank you. This is, uh, this is, thanks. we've been, we've been trying to make this happen for a while, but you're a busy guy. I understand. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> you're making the donuts. I, no, that's, I'm happy to do it. I, you know, I was when you kept asking me, I was like, I, I don't know why anybody would want to see anything I have to say. So, but I'm happy to be here for you, man. I, you know, you're Thank like you. a brother to me. So, and you are, too. you're more like a son to me, but that's just because I'm so <laughs> I don't much know. Older. I don't know. You look, you look the same as you've always looked. I'm getting old. I'm getting a lot of gray going on now. Oh, Joe, I mean, you, you, I, you're getting the front view when you see the side view. Yeah, so sides always hit first, don't they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Side views, not, it's weird. I'll see a picture of me from the side. I'll go, oh my gosh, <laughs> where, where did all that come from? Uh, anyway, uh, we got some great friends watching right now, too, by the way. We got Jean Nadeau. Oh, yeah, Jean. Who's probably way colder than Way you. colder than us, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Jean, our good friend up in Montreal, and Chris Castillo. Oh, nice. Chris yeah, in New York. So, so good stuff. So, yeah. Joey, Joey T., First of all, it's good to see you. Everybody, family's great, right? Everybody's yeah, everybody's good. good. I hope the same for you. Yeah, everybody's good. We're going to see everybody, see the grandkids this weekend. So we're excited about that. Yeah, you got some and, new heads for heads for Fiona, huh? Yes, yes. That's and nice. I don't think she, I think Johnny told her that she was getting new drum heads. So I was going to say it, it might be a surprise, but now that I think about it, I think he, he gave her a heads up. So yeah, on the new heads. Yeah, that's awesome. It is. It's awesome. Excited about that. Um, and I'll give another shout out to, to Chris and everybody at Remo one more time. But um, so let's talk about, first of all, I, I got a call last night from our friend, Steve Gadd, unrelated to this. Okay. Um, he's in Europe and he, of course he wanted to catch up. It was about nine o'clock or eight 30. It's like <laughs> three in the morning. His time. And he's, yeah. he's like, I'm like, but I told him I was going to see you today. And what do you think he said? What do you think the first words out of his mouth were? I'm afraid to say it. I don't, it no, was I don't two know. words. The. <laughs> the the fonts, fonts, right? The yeah. fonts. So I, I'm going to. Joe, I, I swear this, this show is not. I didn't, I didn't suggest this to embarrass you, but I just have to tell the story to people that don't know. Yes, That's it's, right. it's. Yeah. Go ahead. It's funny. It's a funny no, it is story. Funny. It is funny. Go ahead. <laughs> so it's the first mission from Gad tour 2005. Joe is working for Yamaha Drums, artist relations manager for Yamaha Drums. And he's out on the road with us. You came out for the beginning of the tour, which was great because you, you got the drums really tweaked so that when you left, I was able to set them up every night and everything. But so it was early in the tour. We're on the tour bus. I forget what city. It might have been Memphis. It might have been Nashville. Nashville. Was, Nashville. Nashville. Okay, yeah. Nashville. Really, really rainy night. We were like at a, at a, at a restaurant, I guess, with Gary Fork. Gary and, Fork, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and all the Forkstrom uh, guys at a restaurant. And it's getting late. And it's, as I say, it's pouring rain. And we're driving wherever we're driving to for the next city. And you could see Steve was getting tired. And you're sitting across from us. 
and Steve's next to me. And Jerry Andreas was with us, had, I think, popped in for a couple of days. So you and Jerry are kind of talking across the table about something. And uh, Steve <laughs> leans into my ear and he said, he looks at you across the way. And, he <laughs> said, and it was just, it was perfect. He, and, and your hair was, I think maybe because it was raining, it was kind of like kinda a little up more than it <laughs> usually is. And he said, hey, what do you say we get the Fonz and get the fuck out of here? <laughs> Yeah. And, we, and then then all I see is you two just laughing hysterically and looking at me. And I was like, what, what do I have something in my teeth or something? Yeah. You were, you were like, this, this is, you're like, what, what? what? <laughs> yeah. And then when we told you, you were, yeah. And it stuck. It totally yeah. stuck from that point on. Yeah. And you told a couple of people who just ran with that bone and they're still running with it. I'm sorry. I just, uh, it was, I know it was, but he, he, uh, he said to me, he said, say hello to the Fonz for me. That's the first thing he said. <laughs> He's the best, man. You know, for, for I've said this, and people are probably bored of hearing me say it if they've heard it at all, but it, it, there's, it, I mean, it's Steve Gadd, right? So that, everything that goes with that goes with that. But yeah. for me, it, I'm from Rochester. So growing up in Rochester as a drummer, Steve was more than just, Steve, he was like a hometown, like guy who made it out, made it and made it yeah. big, you know? Big time, so sure. like, so he was almost, he's like a, more than a drumming hero. It's kind of like a, um, I don't know how to explain it. You know, it's just a little more personal, feels personal, sure. you know? So it's, um, when we got to finally meet, it was just like meeting one of my uncles, you know? And I'd um, imagine. Yeah. Yep. It's funny. And then a, a few years ago we did, um, his uh dvd you know um way back home oh yeah yeah and yeah. um and so we went back to rochester to interview some of his family man it was like hanging out with my family it was it was so amazing it was just this instant i don't know what it is you know when you meet someone from your hometown there's Absolutely. a connection right you know, so. Absolutely, yeah i i can so. i can totally relate to that yeah it had to be yeah that's and, and and i bet you that had a lot to do with him feeling so comfortable with you instantly you know and 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 for anybody who's who's uh not familiar i said this kind of leading into it but joe worked for yamaha for 12 years so of course that's where your relationship began with steve and now it continues um originally through vic firth and now through zildjian and vic firth and 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 those kinds of you know connections are huge to him as you know i mean he's he's it's all yeah. about that with him like those like being comfortable with people and um, that's you know, why first he never time, liked me. Oh, stop it. He loves you. The first time, the first time I met Steve was 95 when I was working at Warner Brothers. Okay. And yeah. Rob Wallace is the one who introduced us. And it was at the PASIC 95. And I got the picture. Someone took a picture of that when we first met. And then I asked Rob, and Rob got Steve to sign it. This is before Steve knew who I was. It's just another. Yeah. So before yeah. we were working together, he just knew, oh, this, is the, this kid works for Sandy, you know, or something. But yeah, yeah. yeah. But, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Well, I wanted to start there too. Um, Jim Catalano, by the way, is watching and he, and he just wrote a nice little comment. Hi, Jim. And he said, Joe and Johnny are two of my favorite people in this crazy drum industry. <laughs> Snowed in today. So live from my drum room is the perfect place to be. Well, good for you, Jim. Stay, stay warm there, buddy. Jimmy, Jim Catalano. If you, Jim, you need some Erskine sticks, let me know. <laughs> Who loves the Erskine? Stick? Uh, yeah, legendary guy, legendary yeah. guy. Got a, Joe, you got a lot of fans watching. Harry McCarthy, who probably could be out making thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars right now. <laughs> and golfing while he's doing it. <laughs> and golfing. Harry could be making money in golfing. If anybody could do it, it's Harry McCarthy could be making money golfing. And looking handsome, and he's looking watching handsome. us right now. Yeah, he is. So, Harry, it's good to see Chad and Harry. Chad Cromwell also watching. Hello, wow. Chad. Scott Hoffman's watching us. Dave Stark, Jeremy Driesen. Wow, these guys never watch me when I'm when I have other people. It's, <laughs> Stop it. You're gonna be my new co-host. So, so that's I met you when you were working for Warner Brothers in like 1991 or two. I think I was thinking about it. I was like, when I first, we met, I believe it was 91 November PASIC Anaheim. Wow. And I only, okay. there's, it's funny because there's certain miles. I don't, I don't have near the memory you have. Your memory is unbelievable. 
especially for how old you are. It's unbelievable. <laughs> but I, I have no memory, but there's certain things that I, I do remember. And that was because that was my first PASIC. And oh, okay, that, that I, makes sense. I, you know, yeah. I had already kind of know, I had already known about you from, you know, just being in school and being in the drum industry and seeing you in different places going, she says, I got to meet that guy. I want to learn from that guy. Uh, yeah, so I remember coming over to you and you helped. Um, I think some of my friends found a symbol for me because I couldn't get out of the booth and they found a symbol for me and you see, put it aside for me. And, you put, and I still have that symbol. It's actually on my kids. I still love that symbol. Yeah. That's awesome. Anyways, anyway, yeah, I think I, that was November 91. I, I think you're Well, I remember that PASIC was in, at Disneyland in, in yeah. 91. Yeah. 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 Wow. So over, so 30 30 plus years. That's what I thought. I, I figured it was 91, 92. And, and I remember you had, you know, the long hair, the ponytail Jeez. and you were just like Kelly. And I talk about it all the time. You were like this, like nice, innocent guy, you know, like <laughs> a, a nice guy in the drum industry working for Sandy and wide eyed, you know, like what happened? Yeah. <laughs> 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 you got uh, you got caught up in it no i'm kidding no. Oh, it's funny you're probably not as wide-eyed as you were then but you're still a nice guy yeah oh, thank you sir and and you and you, you know a lot so so warner you worked for warner's from 91 to 97 you went right from that to yamaha right yeah it was well or, originally out of school i went you know i went to um, potsdam crane school of music study with jim peters act and when i when i got out of there i went straight to new york city working for dci music video which the old timers will remember what that was. Yeah. That was the original instructional video company, right? And that was Rob right. and Paul, Rob Wallace and Paul, Paul Siegel. And um, I forgot uh, that. Yeah. Yeah. So I started there in May of, of 91. And then January 92, Sandy bought, Sandy at the time was, before it was Warner Brothers, was CPP Bellwin Publishing, yes. which used to be Columbia Pictures Publishing. So they, he, Sandy saw the, the vision, he saw the future and saw the instructional video thing. And so he bought DCI and we moved down to Fort Miami at the time was Miami, Florida. And then a few years later, Warner brothers bought it. And, you know, so I was there from, yeah, I guess you could say 91 to 97. Yeah. Wow. And straight to Yamaha. After that. And, and, and before we jump into Yamaha yard, by the way, is watching. And he said, he is it ponytail question mark yard. I have pictures oh. of ponytail. It yard, was epic. It's it's yeah it's epic <laughs> it was at a time when i love yard i missed him so much man i i know i might be coming over uk drum show so i hope he's there i hope he's there because i'd love to see him it's been too long oh yeah and that's in a couple of months right that's yeah april april two and three i think wow yeah mm. so anyways okay so oh. so you worked for sandy for, for like um, like six years uh or for warner yeah, brothers for, pretty yeah close, yeah and and you're like your your job there was you did did you do like video editing you did sort of or or like a lot uh, of different things yeah it was so it started out initially as dead entry to see if i actually could hang and then it became customer service then i went to sales and then i moved down to sales and they gave me international styles and i couldn't take sales anymore and was waiting to get out and there was an opening over in production and it was called a production coordinator and I applied and got out and went there. As soon as I got the production coordinator gig, I suddenly was in, I was responsible for helping the, the editors who would put together the music books, instructional books mm -hmm. from the beginning of the project and see it all the way to the end. So I was the guy who was kind of the grease between all the wheels and making sure the product moved along and made the timing. Um, as soon as I got over there, Sandy and I finally got to connect, literally connect. And he, he would, um, Oh, this is a good story. So the reason we started working with, so Russ Miller, our friend Russ, yeah, he had a yeah. book called the Crash Course, uh, you know, for dummies, um, not, not for dummies, it's just a crash course for drum set. And he had done it himself. But he, come, he came and he came to Sandy and showed it Sandy and Sandy's like, hey, it's really great, but I already have a bunch of books like this. So I, I, I respectfully have to decline. And he was like, okay. So then Russ hit me up. And we connected and he started asking me, would you edit this for me? Cause I want to release it on my own. Cause Sandy doesn't want to do it. And I was like, you know what? I, I could use some extra bread and this seems pretty cool. I think there's something here. So we started working on it together and we ended up editing this book. So he, I edited the book. He releases it on his own. It was hysterical. I had pictures of two uh, 
car dummies, you know, that they use for the crashes. Yeah, I remember this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And my kits on the cover, we took pictures of all the my drums and used it as like they're all crashing. It was, anyways, I was really proud of it. So I, I said to Sandy, he was on his way to a modern drummer festival to shoot that the festival. We used to shoot those festivals for instructional videos. Yeah. I said, hey, if you could do me a favor, would you mind taking a look at this and just tell me what you think? He said, sure. He took it and said, okay, kid, I'll see you later. And he took off. So the next weekend, he comes back on Monday and I'm on the phone. He walks over and all of a sudden his book just falls on my desk, you know, thrown on my desk. And I was like, oh, and I look up and it's him. And he's like, come see me when you're off the phone. And I'm like, okay. So he walks away and I'm on the phone and I start looking through the book. Johnny, it looked like he took a red pen and just, just <laughs> ink, red ink all over it. Like just all the corrections everywhere throughout it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I guess this was a bad idea. So I get off the phone and I'm like, oh, this is going to suck. So I walk into his office and I go, uh, I guess, I guess you didn't like it, huh? And he, he was facing the other way in one of those, those pivot chairs and he swung around and he goes, what are you kidding? I loved it. You think I'd spend that much time on something I didn't like? And he, and he, and he grabs the book from me and he turns it around. He had this amazing talent to be able to write upside down. So you could oh, see wow. And he would be writing. So he was showing me all the stuff wow. that he's like, if we, if you did this, it would have been better. If you did that, you see what you did here. And if you did, he goes, do me a favor, make these corrections and we'll publish it now. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, he goes, go make the correct. Cause this is a good book. Now go make these corrections and we'll release it. And I was, so I called up for us and he's like, what? <laughs> so that's, so then him and so then Sandy started, started work, basically teaching me. Mm. He became my mentor at that point. And, I remember. Yeah. So all the percussion books that we were coming out with, I would have to, I would edit and, or sometimes write, he'd have us write some stuff, but Mike Finkelstein, you remember Mike? Oh, Mike. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, the first class guy. Um, yeah. So anyways, okay. it, it, that, so that's that house. And then when they eventually, um, eventually Sandy and Warner couldn't come to an agreement. And so he was no longer running the company. And I was like, I'm, I have no reason. I was pretty heartbroken. And um, also was like, there's no one here to teach me anything anymore. You know, so at that point, I was kind of like, and then the Warner Bros thing, came, I mean, the, the Yamaha thing came about. And so there you go. Wow, cool, cool backstory. I didn't know I didn't know a lot of those details, you know, the with Russ's book, I, I remember that I remember the, the book being published, you know, but I didn't know that backstory. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was, it was, uh, it's pretty funny how it worked. You know, and what was funny about the Yamaha interview. So this is, this is a great story. So <laughs> I don't even know if I should, yeah, I guess it's all right. So I, I called up Russ cause he's a Yamaha guy too. And so I said to Russ, I said, Hey man, I got to get out of here. If you hear of any gig in the industry, let me know, blah, blah, blah. He says, Hey, I heard that they're possibly moving Yamaha from drum set from B&O back to California. And at the time, John Whitman, who I loved to death, yeah. <laughs> didn't want to move back to California. So he was just going to take over to B&O side and let the drum set go. So they're going to be looking for someone. And so just to give you a heads up. So of course I call Sandy and I told him and I go, no one's supposed to know. And Sandy's like, how do you know that? He already knew, of course. <laughs> and I'm like, I told him. And so he's like, do you want that job? And I was like, i love a chance at it. Sure. So he's like, okay. So he hangs up. So I go to lunch. I'm like, whatever. So I go to lunch. I come back from lunch and there's a, there's voicemails, right? So I'm in the old days, you had voicemail. So you, you know, yeah, we listened yeah. to the, there was no texting yet. So um, I listened to the first, first voicemail of Sandy going, okay, Joe, Jay Wanamaker is going to call you. And he's kind of overseeing this move to the West coast and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> he says, he's going to call you. You know, blah, blah, blah. The next, the next message is Jay Wanamaker, <laughs> like literally. And I'm like, my, you know, so I'm like, you know, I'm like, what the hell's happening here? So did you know who Jay was at the time? Yeah, well, I know you, Jay because he, he, yeah. he also went to, um, he was a uh, Potsdam alumni as well. So I had oh, known okay. of him and I had met him once yeah. when he came up for uh, James Peter Zach's uh, anniversary concert and stuff, but we didn't really know each other. He's like, hey, it's Jay Wanamaker. Um, give me a call. You know, I just talked to Sandy. And I click. I hang up the phone. And I'm kind of just <laughs> trying to digest it. 
the phone rings. And so I pick up the phone. He's like, Joe, it's Jay. And I'm like, I didn't even like, I haven't, I just listened to your voicemail, man. <laughs> and he's like, send your resume over here. Here's the email. Here's the fax. Blah, blah. A fax. I had the fax. fax. Over. Yeah. Yeah. I had to sneak that, you know, so I faxed <laughs> that over and, and then I didn't hear anything for months. Oh, wow. And then okay. if you remember Mars music, right? Yes. Yeah. So he flew in, he was flying into Fort Lauderdale for a Mars grand opening. And he said, let's get together for dinner. And so we got together for dinner and, you know, one thing led to another. And the first, oh, so, so then when I go for my interview, okay. So I'm like, I don't know what, I have no idea what I'm doing, John. Like, you know what I mean? I only know publishing. I don't. So I take all the list of guys that we had um, videos or instructional videos and books with, you know, and I printed out what I call my roster at the time, you know, for publishing. Yeah. Sure. But, and I highlighted all the Yamaha guys. Smart. Yeah. Right. So I just, and I put that in my pocket. So I go into the interview and you walk in the room and there's a room full of Japanese guys that barely speak English. And right before we walk in, Jay goes, okay, listen, whatever you do, you know, they don't, English isn't their first language. So speak slowly. Don't go into great detail or elaboration, just simple answers. Okay. And I'm like, okay. And we walk in. First thing he goes, he goes, why don't you tell everybody what you do at Warner Brothers? John, I'm doing like four things that like, not anything to do with manufacturing, it's publishing. So it's like, not even in their wheelhouse. So I'm trying to process how do I explain this simply to them without being able to speak normal, right? I, I'm trying to dumb it down, right? And I'm freaking dying, dude. <laughs> I'm like, I am like plane crash going straight down, like just dying. <laughs> and finally, uh, was Hadi what, in, the, in the room? Yeah, what was yeah. He, so was yeah, he was in the room. So I, it was somewhere in my my bat blabbing and i could see jay just going oh my gosh <laughs> he's dying he's, yeah. he's, he's dying and there's nothing that's helping i pull out that paper i said oh, these are the guys i've worked with and i'm gonna... so hockey's just not even listening he just reached over grabbed the paper and pulled it in and looked at it and he just kind of he didn't wasn't listening at all he just was looking at the paper and then he looked up and he says you know so and so and i was like yeah and then we talked about that person he's like yeah Oh, okay. All right. Lunch. And they brought in pizza. I'm like, what is going on here? Like, this is the weirdest thing ever. <laughs> we had lunch and they go, okay, Joe, why don't you go out in the other, in the cubicle over there and read some magazines or something, you know? So I'm sitting there reading some, and then Hagi ended up being right in the doorway out of nowhere. He just kind of shows up, you know, and he's like, you got any questions for me? He, ma he materialized. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and you got any questions for me? And I was like, yeah, what, what happened with Vinny? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh of all the food it's Wrong funny question. it's timely because it's yeah. it just happened like about a year or so beforehand and yeah yeah so he went into a whole explanation no whatever so the next thing they know they offered me the gig and so I, I went back and the first person the first artist I told was Peter Erskine because he was at Mars Music doing a clinic and I just got the news and we were going to have dinner that night and I told him Fantastic. So, yeah, Peter's Peter's a special guy, man. So he sure is. Yeah, so wow. Anyway, sorry. That's probably yeah. no. That's great. And Charlie Drayton's watching, by the way. And and oh, I love Charlie. Yeah. Man, I here's a story you. about Charlie. Yeah, let's hear so, Charlie's the Charlie Drayton story. Yeah. So Charlie, probably one of my favorite musicians in the world. Like when he plays drums, I hear music, right? And yeah. There was a, it really came into focus for me. We, we, at Yamaha, we were coming out with the Phoenix kit and we were doing prototyping. And this was like to see if guys liked it or not. We had one of the studios in North Hollywood and, and I, I really wanted his input on this because I knew if he liked it, it would be, you, you knew, you, you know, we were onto something. Yeah. So he came in and, and I got a lesson, man, of how to set up drums. I, I've never seen anything like this before in my life, man. The way he sets his drums up and his cymbals up and tunes them it's say, it's tuning, a yeah. it's a lesson like i've never seen anybody do this and it's amazing and i mean even the symbols like he has them so they they're just touching so when you hit one they all shimmer like mm -hmm. he knows mm -hmm. exactly what he's doing in every stroke he's performing it's amazing so 
we had the drums, he had them all set up and he started playing and we were recording just to hear what they would sound like. The, I used his drumming tracks as the soundtrack to the promotional video for those drums that never got released. Actually, that, that video never got released, but I got them. But I got the hard drive with all his. I mean, he, he it was so beautiful just listening to him play the drums alone. Yeah, I was like, we used it as the as the soundtrack. So it was. That's a great uh, story. Yeah, he's he's amazing. Well, I, now that I know he's watching. I've been trying to get Charlie to do this for, I don't know how long now. And I'm going to, I'm going to put the full court press on him again. I can't, I gave him a little breathing room. He went on the road with Bob Dylan and I knew he was going to be busy, but, but Charlie, I love you endlessly. And I'm going to, I'm going to hound you now. I, I saw him on an old SNL one night. I don't know, like a couple of years ago. And it was like 11 o'clock at night. It wasn't, it wasn't a lot. It was a repeat of an old show from, I don't know how many years ago. And I think he was playing with Neil Young. And I texted him and he was like, what it's on, is it on right now? I, Cause I think he said other people had texted him or something. And, but anyway, I just said, I've, you know, we've got to do this. We've got to do this. And but he's a humble guy. So it's, he's, I'm going to have to maybe see him in person and twist his arm a little. So, yeah, he's, he's, I hope, I hope you can do it. Cause yeah. I would, I would love to see that. Yeah. Me he's too. so great. Me too. So, um, that's great. And, and, you know, we, we were talking offline about just, um, and, and this is this is about you, but just the 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 honor that we've both had of knowing God. You know, we were talking. You were, had that picture of you and Roy Haynes from um, Pasic all those years ago, and just the fact that you know, working at Yamaha all those years, you got to know Elvin on a really great personal level, and and Roy and Earl Palmer, and yeah. Um, you know, so many, and you know, the guys we've already talked about, Charlie and Steve, and I'll even mention Rick Murata, you know, and, and which is, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, <laughs> no, I, I put that picture of the three of us from Groove Night. I saw that. Yeah. With the hopes that he'd see it and comment on it, but he, he, he probably never did. So, but, um, yeah. but I, I want to, and I want to talk about Groove Night too, because I mentioned that I did something for the Drum History podcast couple of weeks ago and I mentioned how phenomenal those shows were and um I know there's like little bits of them of, like on YouTube I think yeah. Carlos I have I have a lot of it and, you do, yeah 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 Car Carlos you? Carlos has been he leaks them out a little bit yeah but yeah, I have yeah. a lot of that stuff that um yeah I think they, they were amazing and and you know I mean kind of seeing them from the inside so to speak because I'd, I'd come out to LA and I'd have dinner with you and Rick at Asanebo when you guys were like in the planning process and, and that it was, was more of the the beat on Joe process <laughs> <laughs> and then after you beat on him have him pay for dinner <laughs> well I'd always split it with you I, I figured I was there to help yeah, it's only because you felt so bad for me <laughs> <laughs> I was there to share your pain when Rick ordered yeah. everything on the menu yeah. but yeah. um no, but I mean, those for, for anybody, you know, we were all lucky to see those shows because they were amazing. I mean, they were just, it was like every great drummer on the planet with the greatest band, you know, with, a, with you know, Robbie Wyckoff and Neil Steubenhaus and Ross and Bolton, God rest Ross his soul, Bolton. Mark yeah. Williamson, yeah. Ralph yeah. McDonald. Ralph, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was the band. Will, was, Will um, and Neil Steubenhaus, and it, it was pretty yeah. stupid. And then Spinoza. Right, right, right. But you know, I, 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 look, that, all kidding aside, Rick, Rick is probably one, one of the people who's taught me the most about a lot of things in the business. Like it's, yeah. he's pretty amazing. You know, he's an amazing individual and just great human being all around. So he, um, <laughs> so they had, they, we need to come, we need to have a Yamaha drum night. That's how it started. Yeah. And so it was going to be this. I don't care what it costs. Who cares what it costs? That would be Rick. Yeah. yeah well, no, Rick wasn't, didn't know anything about it yet. Right. So it was like just the Yamaha people like saying, we need a drum show. We want to do a drum show. And so it was going to be this, the same old, same old where, you know, everybody gets up and, and blows for, you know, their 15 minutes and the next guy comes up and, and um, I, I said, you know, it'd be cool if we had someone to host it like MC it that like everybody knows and who could mm -hmm. bring a little funny humor to it, you know, cause he knows everybody. 
And uh, they went, oh, that's a good idea. What do, you, what do you think? And I said, I think Rick would be a great person because like he knows so many people and he knows about them and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh, let's go meet them. So we go to his studio. So Rick, so we got this idea. <laughs> <laughs> we want to do a drum show for Yamaha. And we want to have all these guys and want you to MC. And you're going to come up. We're all excited. We're like, we're thinking he's going to go, yeah, let's do it. He goes, I would never freaking do that. <laughs> He goes, that is the <laughs> worst idea I've ever heard of in all my life. And we were like, I didn't know. Are you kidding? Or is he like serious? And he was totally serious. And we were all just like, oh, wow. And he was well, like, but what I would do. And then he goes into, he lays out the whole idea of no drum. So he went the complete yeah. opposite, right? Like completely thought outside the box and was like, forget the drum souls, man. We make a living playing music. Right. Let's go play music for people and let these guys be seen playing music. And then I'll do that. And we're like, what do you think? And everybody's like, I don't make that seems so simple, but so genius. I know, and, you I know. know. It, it really was. Gen- I'll tell you, it was genius in its simplicity because no one was doing that. It was so unique. And I remember you telling me about it and I'm thinking, and I swear the, the, the first thing I thought was, <laughs> Oh man, this is going to be great. I really did because I thought like, you know, no offense to drum solos, but how many times have you and I been to Montreal Drum Fest and Modern Drummer Festival and PASIC and all these places where great drummers play great drum solos? But it was such a the idea was I remember you because you were looking for sponsorship. So you kind of let me in on it early on what you had in mind. And I just want to throw out this for people watching, too, to know that at the time Rick was doing Everybody Loves Raymond. Yeah. And yes, dear, he was like, he was like the guy, he was composing music for the biggest TV show on TV. Yeah. So he, he definitely, you, you could see Rick saying no, cause he's like, you know, I'm, I don't need to do this. Yeah. It's like mailbox money personified, you know, right. Yeah. The, the definition of it, the definition but, uh, of it, the definition of it, but no, but he, but because he has, you know, all, all kidding aside, I mean, he has very high standards when it comes to this kind of stuff, and he's not going to put his name on something that he doesn't think is, you know, he's going to want to make it be the best it can be, and that's what we yeah. love about and it. And, and it has to be, it had to be different, right? It, it couldn't just yeah. be the same thing, right? And yeah. so, can I first, can I tell a funny yeah. story real yeah, quick? Please. Yeah. One of the earliest groove nights that I remember, and I don't know how many years you did them, but like from I want to say from about ninety eight. At SIR in Hollywood, right? That was the Two, first one. 2000 was the first Two, one. 2000, okay, at SIR. Yeah, it was when the NAMM show was in LA for those couple of years. Um, but it might have been that one or, or maybe when you moved to back to, when it moved back to Orange County. When the, anyway. I'll I remember, know when you start telling me. <clears throat> well, <laughs> I, ha- I had the, the good fortune of oftentimes being backstage, you know, like while they were going on and, and the hang backstage was, was <laughs> that was where the camera should have been. I know it was, it was unbelievable. And I remember one time Sonny came up to play Sonny Emery, which is always a treat. And it was one of the early ones. Cause I think, yeah, I think it was one of the first two. times it was, just... it was number two. Okay. It was, it, a, been... it was the first one at the galaxy in Santa Ana. Okay. I, so I think it was that one. Cause I think it was the first time yeah. anybody played a drum fill and it's Sonny, a beginning too <laughs> yeah and he, you know what i'm talking about yeah he does yeah. this unbelievable fill and the stick twirl thing and this awesome thing and peter erskine is standing backstage and he has like a towel and he, he and he goes whoa whoa and he like like a referee <laughs> to football game he throws the flag he goes throwing the flag it was you had to be there it was, oh, the, it was so peter good. was the funniest thing i was yeah. dying because he's like flag, flag on, the, on play, the play flag on the play <laughs> oh that was Um, great yeah i mean that's an example of how the hang was like it was what we all look forward to every year it really was was a lot of fun it kind of just became a a really good kind of family reunion thing you know it was a lot of fun yeah Yeah, we did five we did five we did five groove nights and then we did two groove all-stars which was the same thing just a different name at a different venue and then we did one in Germany and three, oh, yeah. three or four in Mexico throughout the, at, the length of the whole time. You know, I was at the one in Germany. I remember that one, 2000. Yeah, that was, that was a good one. Yeah. That was a great that was one. Fun. That was fun. Yeah. That was different, yeah. but it was fun. Um, so. 
I was going to say that I remember the, the one of one of them at the galaxy, you'll know the year, but it was the year that maybe Michael Bland played more than one of them. But when Michael Bland played the first, yeah, the first time the Aerosmith tune, uh, last child, I think it yep. was. Yep. And talk about like the entire house coming down, everybody yeah. in the whole place just stopped and yeah. like picked their job off the floor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it was, uh, what was funny about that is, we, we had three kits on stage, right? Because you had to yeah. rotate. So you had to have, you right. couldn't stop the show for a keep change. So while, while one guy was playing, the other two were being set up and it just kept moving. So it just worked out that Michael's kit was all the way on the other freaking side of the stage, like the farthest point to walk. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, Mike comes out and he's a presence. So the whole place got quiet. You know, it's, he walked across the whole stage and then got on the kit. And when they counted it off, I don't think it was three beats in before the whole place was on their feet. Yeah. Flipping out because the groove was so, so entrenched. So, I mean, Rick yeah. was screaming backstage and he was like, he's got to be on every show, every show we do. He's got to be on it. Like, yeah. It was amazing. Ama I watched it from up front. We, you know, we had those, those box uh, yeah. up at the galaxy, the box <laughs> seats that you got us. And uh you know, and there'd be a lot of people hanging out and we'd have food and drinks in there. And I, I'd be like trying to watch it and people would be wanting to, some people would be chatting behind me or something or going, hey, and when he played the entire, every, everybody just stopped and just yeah. watched. It was like, yeah. yeah. Another, another moment like that was Tommy Aldridge. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And that yeah. was, that was at a groove all star at the Cerrito center. And he did, crying in the rain by white snake yes and he brought in doug perkins on guitar who's the white snake guitar player at the time it was so unbelievable i i saw guys on the tables jumped up on the table screaming for tommy because he was just they that song as the guitar soul builds and builds and builds, the tension just gets higher and higher and the drumming has a lot to do it with the tension yeah and it just People Thomas. were losing their freaking mind over that. Yeah. Like it was, that was a good one too. And he was doing all the cymbal grabs that he does yeah. and all yeah. that. I mean, it was just like classic Tommy Aldridge. Yeah. It was totally awesome. Yeah. And the yeah. other one that comes, I mean, there was, everybody was great. Cause you had every, I mean, when you can see, you know, Russ Kunkel and, and Rick Murata on the same bill, you know, or yeah. Peter Erskine, it's like, are you kidding me? And, uh, but I remember when, when Keith Carlock played, won't get fooled again. Yeah, was a, that was like that was insane yeah it was just insane yeah oscar seaton that Oscar's, was a great one yes. he did uh oh, what tune was it again uh georgie porgy <sighs> yes that's right yeah 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 yes. hey our friend chris yes. hart is watching by the way chris, chris hart says, yep he says tell jt go raiders what is wrong with him like we just pray we just gave him all this praise and then he goes and ruins it like that like he and i have always had an idea of having the chris and joe show that would be a good show, that would be be, a good show. it'd be funny it would be it would be uh, chris hart can do no wrong in my book yeah he can he can he can say go raiders absolutely yeah oh Sorry. man so 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 a lot of great memories you know a lot of and a lot of a lot of um great accomplishment accomplishments at Yamaha too. I mean, you signed a lot of big guys and um, yeah, we had fun. It was a good time. It was a good era, you know, a uh, good team. I mean, that, you know, that was a, a really each, you know, man, every stage of whenever there were successes, it was always a team. There was never yeah. one person. And, you know, that era was like, you had Jerry Andreas, Dave Jewell, and Prudence Elliott and myself. And then shortly thereafter, you had um, Jordan Barth. Jordan Barth. Yeah. And, and then was Jim Howard. It was other guys too, but the, the core of it, the start of it in 97 was that three. And then, it, yeah. you know, and it was, uh, it was a really special group. I mean, it was, we all really worked together really well. It was just a great combination, you know? It was absolutely. I can tell you from, from the outside looking in, you guys, you guys were a great team and you could see that you, you did a lot of great work together as a team. You know, they had you doing the artist relations. You had Jerry was the marketing guy. You had Dave doing the sales product side. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, Prudence, Prudence, yeah, Prudence basically cleaning up everything we screwed up. Yeah, the, the glue. Yeah, yeah, she was the engineer. She really was. Were, yeah, they were yeah. the glue. And then Jordan, the then it got too crazy. We had to get Jordan in to help out. So. Yeah, no, that, that's great. And then from there, you went to, to I was going to say Zildjian, but you went to Vic Firth when it was still Vic Firth. Yeah, yeah, you and were there was, when that happened. I was that there. Was, yeah. Um, can I can I tell a little story? I, I, yeah, I think go I ahead. Told I, you a story. Yeah, go ahead. You tell it. <laughs> so there was a for people watching. You know, this I remember the year it was 2010, and uh, and there was an opening at Vic Firth for an artist relations director, and uh, and Vic called me. For anyone who doesn't know, I, I'm Vic's son-in-law. Rest his soul. Uh, Kelly, my wife, is Vic's daughter. And so we had a great, you know, personal relationship and a, and, and a great business relationship. And Vic uh, called me and he said, John, I, you know, I forget exactly how he said it. He said, I, I, I need your help. I, you know, I need to ask you a question. Um, and I think he even said to me, I know what you're going to say. <laughs> like he said, I'm going to need, I'm, I'm looking to get somebody to do artist, artist relations. And I, I think I know who you're going to suggest. And I said, well, then you know who I'm going to suggest. I said, Joe Testa. And he said, yeah, that's, that's what I've been hearing. And it wasn't like he didn't, he, but he said, tell me why. And I said, because he's, he's the right guy. He's the right fit. He knows all these guys. He can walk into the building on day one and know all your top artists. Like there's no getting to know anybody. He's, they already know who he is. They love him, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, typical Vic, he just wanted to just like, he wanted to analyze it and just, you know, he didn't, he, do his I due think diligence. Yeah. he do his due diligence. And I think he'd heard it. He, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not taking any credit because he'd heard it from enough people already. His Tracy, his daughter, who was still working at the company. I think that you were the first person she recommended. And um, so anyway, but it was a great, situation for you where you went to go work for Vic Firth and and that was 12 yeah we were or, yeah we were at Memphis for the symbol symbol uh symbol that's, summit that's right Jim Pettit right that's right and um at the time I had, I had a temporary moment at Nashville living in Nashville for seven and a half weeks and so Jim Pettit had called and asked hey well, I'm doing a symbol summit would you mind filming it which your guys that you know, I know you can do that, blah, blah. So I call up some friends who, you know, know how to work the camera. We, so we came in to film it. So we were doing it. And um, yeah, I be careful about that. But I, <laughs> I don't know what, you know, I got wind that this was going down there. When he called me, um, I was there yeah. at, at, and I couldn't pick up the phone. I saw him call and I was like, oh crap, I can't. Then I called and he called me back. I picked it up and he's like, Hey, Joe, it's Vic. Look, I don't want anybody to know, but I'm looking for someone. I've tried to hire you two times already. This is the last time I'm freaking asking you. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I, At that time, I was like, I'm in, I'm in, let's do it. You know, like, Can you come up today? I'm like, I'm on a gig. I can't, the earliest I can get there will be Tuesday. He's like, Book the flight, come up Tuesday. So. That's I forgot that. Yes. Yeah. 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 I told you, 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 you yeah. were there. And I'm like, John, John, I was like, yeah. what's going on? I, I know. I know. I remember I was, I was so happy. I was so happy for you. So happy for Vic. And then the Zildjian Vic Firth merger happened. Yeah. Later shortly thereafter. Yeah. Yeah. Not long after. And, um, and now you're, now you're, you're the man running the show there. Then we got to work together for a minute and then yeah. you went, you went and had to go retire and start your podcast. <laughs> Joe, I'm fulfilling my dream. You, you're doing it, man. When I was 10 years old, I used to say to my dad, he'd say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'd say, I want to be a podcaster. <laughs> and he'd say to me, that hasn't been invented yet. It's 1970. <laughs> Think of something else. And I'd say a drummer. Oh. No, but uh, no, that's my, my little inside joke is that when I was, you know, when I was a little boy, I dreamed of being a podcaster. Yeah, well, you're um, doing a good job of it. Well, thanks, brother. Thank you. And you are too. So yeah, so we, we got to work for a little while. We got to work together for a little while. And then, you know, over time, I know that that Zildjian and, and like for a period of time, the two companies were very, you know, very separate from each other. Yeah, but autonomous. They, yeah. Autonomous, but they've sort of consolidated, which, you know, which makes sense. And, and so now you're doing, you're doing Zildjian and Vic Firth. Mm -hmm. Vice yeah. president. Yeah. Yeah. Again, not alone. I mean, you know, yeah. the team is amazing. You have 
Kirsten, yeah. Kirsten, 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 Matt, you know, who's been here for is, I think I'm at Kirsten in 90, I think 97. I can tell you when she started, it was 1995. Yeah. So I met her 97 because I had just gotten the gig at Yamaha, went into the Zildjian office. We met, we, we, I always got along with her, you know, and so we hit it off. And so we always been in touch throughout the years, but she's yeah. unbelievable wealth of knowledge and, you know, just been around forever, you know, so it's great. Um, then we have, uh, Eric Gross, who is, uh, <laughs> Eric was, Eric's a touring drummer. He actually went to Berkeley and got a whole thing. And he's a great drummer. He's, he's more in the metal side of things, but he's actually played an orchestral gig with his uncle as a percussionist. So wow. he also knows percussion. So he's done some local percussion gigs, you know, in the, in the orchestra pit and all that. He's legit. Um, yeah, he's legit. And, um, wow. Okay. And so he's, he's the youngest one on board our team, but, but not young and his soul is, is good. You know, he's, he's yeah. there for everybody. He gets it. Then we have Brian who does our BNO AR. Uh, he, he comes, he originally with the cadets and everything. He's an amazing player and um, he's overseeing all the BNO. And then we have. Uh, That's band and orchestral folks. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. That's and then uh, Mark Wessels and uh, is director of education. So. And then we have <clears throat> Bob Whistling, who you know, who's been around longer than all of us. Yes. Like, you know, yeah. Bob is amazing uh, in the UK. Yep. And then um, then there's Keith Aleo and, and Anders Strand, who, who are not employees, but more consultants, but they're, they're like our family to us. Mm -hmm. We talk to them every day. So anyway, yeah. long story short, it's a small team when you consider we're doing all of Zildjian and all of Vic and all the percussion genres. But we're making it happen because these guys are awesome and that's great you know that's covid great. made us a lot smaller but it came made us tighter and made us really a family i feel anyways and so yeah yep i would think so i would think it 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 kind of you know you got to all pull together in those situations yeah it's been a rough two years for everybody you know i'm, I'm hoping praying to god we're finally getting to some 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 i don't want to say normal but yeah me too let's get some gigging man <laughs> yeah exactly i know we all we all want to get back out and gig and just do stuff you know i just want to see people again you know i miss everybody yeah i know absolutely so so what you know i, I made a couple of notes i made a couple of little um, one of the things i wanted to do which you just did which is great is give a shout out to the ar team so thanks for doing that um because they're all you know kirsten worked for me for many many years and she's i can't say enough about her she's great you Fantastic. should you should interview her I should, she's, you know, she's I, got story. You guys go back a long way, man. Probably like, wouldn't do it. She's the kind of person that I know. would go, I don't want to do it. You know, she'd be no. harder to get than I was. <laughs> she'd be as hard to get as Hard, Charlie Drayton. Charlie Drayton. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't mean to say like, she'd go, I don't want to do it. No, she, she's very humble. She, she's always been like that behind the scenes person, you know? Yeah. So, but I think get a good her and though. Charlie together. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Yeah. Maybe even Anyways. Anne Marie, Anne Marie San Filippo. Yes. Who was at Zildjian West when I started there in 89. Well, and she's, yeah. She knows her, between her and Kirsten, they can, they like know offshore bank accounts and <laughs> kinds of stuff. You <laughs> know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, but so, so what's it, you know, I've been, it's hard to believe. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, but I used to work at Zildjian myself. I, I, this is your show, but. It's a, it's kind of an odd coincidence that I'm doing this right now. And I, I actually work, I, they probably don't remember me, but I had an office there and it's, it's like in the back. <laughs> it was, the walls were red at the time, but. You know who's in that office now? Katie Zilson. Oh. Katie well, Zilson. And I can't think of a better person. Like it's so perfect, you know. Me too. And, um, and let's Eric's give a shout right out to her. Katie. Maybe if she could be watching, maybe not. She's probably busy. She's so Working great. right now, but yeah, yep. she is great. And I don't know if you know, you, you probably know Emily, her sister. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. I knew them when they were like little youngsters. And I think Aaron Comis is watching this right now. I brought them to a spin doctor show. This would have been close to 30 years ago. Wow. When, you know, when the spins first hit like 92, 93, and they were like little tykes, you know, and, and Debbie, asked me could you take them to see the spin doctor so i took them with me and <laughs> and uh yeah they were like sweet little kids so yeah yeah now katie's you know a big wig in the company yeah yeah 
She's doing great. It's yeah. awesome. So, so I'm sorry. So, we, we... No, no. Anyway, I, I know I, 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 I was trying to be funny and I ended up sending us down a silly road. Vinny was trying to make a joke about <laughs> that. I used to work there, um, which is no but, joke. But your presence is still very much felt. So, you know, well, that's nice to know. Thanks, Joe. Um, so, so artist relations today, I know when I was still there, it was becoming more challenging to, to just, you know, <clears throat> identify and evaluate and kind of, you know, build a program and run the program. And, and I'm just wondering if there's any insights you can share for people to know, like what you look for when you're signing people, when you're evaluating, I'm sure you still get tons of applications and people wanting to be with the company and, yeah, it's, it's, it's a crazy time. You know, I think the whole industry, it, it, it's a weird, you kind of lived through the Camelot years. Yeah. I, I got a, a little taste of it at the, the tail end of those Camelot years. And then it, I feel like the rest of my career has been just trying to keep up with the unbelievable amount of change away from what it was like, you know, in the day. And, um, but still remember that, you know what I mean? Like, so it's, it's a different time. And obviously what's gone on the last two years has made it incredibly more difficult, but the, um, sure. yeah. as far as finding talent, you know, it's, it's a weird time because I was just talking to someone about this the other day, Gary Novak and I were talking and I've, and actually I've had this conversation with a lot of people. So it's, I'm just remember the last one being with Gary, but you have, used to sign people because they were the gig they were on, mm. right? They had a great gig. So you get exposure for the brand and blah, blah, blah. And that's still relevant, right? But now you have this whole new venue in the digital space. You know, you have, you have um, social, all the social media and all that stuff is a new venue. It's where you have to go where the people are hanging out. Sure. And that's yeah. where the kids are hanging out, right? So you have all these people who have like a bazillion followers, but they've never played a gig in their life. Like, I mean, when I say a gig, like they didn't, they're yeah. not like, I'm not playing with Journey or I'm playing with Chikoria or I'm playing with Santana or whatever. There's very few, there's not, there's, there's less of that. Mm -hmm. There's, there's more of the digital thing. And right. it doesn't right. mean they're not talented. And they're very talented. In fact, sometimes they're doing stuff that like no one's ever been able to do but you're like trying to juggle like this, like you have, you, you want people who actually can, I mean, there's a lot of talented people that can't play a gig and you're like, well, what's important. What's not important. It's like, well, if you don't have the brand's exposure in front of all those people on the digital platform, someone else is going to have it. And right. so you're yeah. juggling this, this integrity thing when it comes to one side and then, but there's integrity on the other side, but the two integrities don't always jive does that yeah, am i yeah. making sense like, no it I'm makes sure. sense it, it, it's a it's i was seeing it joe when i was still there i was seeing it was it was starting to move in that direction and in the nine years now that i haven't been doing it it's i know it's really evolved it's really grown and and i think you you summed it up perfectly you know the, the you know that is that is a, a genre now you know that that's like you know when i was when i was doing artist relations you had rock and you had jazz and you had latin and you had all these different genres yeah, right. and that's yeah. kind of its own genre now so um yeah there's yeah, still the four pillars so you know i i look at i have there's there's i look at four main things and it, it's more complicated but to dumb it down there's like you look at personality you look at exposure you look at loyalty and you look at talent mm -hmm. and in a combination thereof right like if if a guy is a jerk but he has all the other three, but he's a jerk. I'd rather him be someone else's jerk. Yeah. I, yep. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, yeah. it's not worth it. Like you want to, it's the bus rule, right? You want to, you could be the baddest dude in the world, but if you're a disaster to hang with, I'd rather have the second best guy and have a great hang. Yeah, exactly. You know? And so it's kind of the same idea. Right. And then yep. exposure, you know, and that, that's where it's different now. It's like, well, you could be doing live gig exposures or you can be doing digital exposures now. So there's the, yeah. And you loyalty, you'd like to find people that are already playing your stuff. Right. Um, Cause then, it, you know, it's honest and true and they're not just looking for a deal and then talent, obviously you want someone to be 
decent at what they do, right? Because you're representing a certain level of brand. So you want it to be that good. So it's that kind of combination, you know? That's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, a, great, that's a great way of, you know, very sort of generally explaining what the sort of four pillars of criteria are. Yeah, um, yeah. More or less. Yeah, that's great. I think that's, that's helpful to people. I think that, I, I think, you know, that's one of those things that, people, you know, still ask me, and I'm sure they ask you all the time, like, you know, what do I have to do? And um, yeah, the other thing too, to, and I, I want, I actually wanted your perspective on this. Everybody says, I want an endorsement, I want an endorsement. Really, as the artist, you're endorsing the company. Yeah, exactly. We're not endorsing you. We, we do in the sense that we honor, we ex, we're acknowledging the relationship as official, but you are saying, I like to play Zildjian or I like to play Vic Firth. Those are my brand. Those are what I play. I endorse that. Absolutely. Yeah. And then the official endorsement is comes when we say, yes, we acknowledge that official relationship. Let's start something together. And I think, and this has been age old. I mean, Rich Manager Carroll will tell you, like, all, all of the guys have been around and say the same thing. It's like, everybody thinks you get an endorsement and you just get back the truck up with free gear. And just drop it <laughs> off at my house. And yeah, it's like, yeah. you know, well, that was Camelot. And Camelot's <laughs> long been gone. And uh, now it's just sometimes just a relationship. And, and you get good pricing and you get service. And when you need something, we're there to help you and stuff like that, which is goes, it's worth a lot, you know. But absolutely. Yeah. The free thing is a really different world now. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, I think, I, I think my guess is that's kind of how it is with all the companies. You know what I mean? I, I think you're, what you're talking about, I, I don't think I'm wrong when I say is pretty much industry wide now that it's not like Zildjian is, is just this way, but all these other companies are still, or, or are very liberal with giveaways, you know, Lenny, the great late, great Lenny DeMuso used to have a great line when uh, we would talk about, drummers or or a potential i'd say lenny i just got a phone call from you know joe blow you know wanting to uh talk about coming on board and he'd say johnny yeah uh, johnny he's he's got a bad case of the gimmies <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of gimmies yeah he's got a bad ah johnny he's got a bad case of the gimmies ah, so, <laughs> be careful with him, you know, I mean, you know, there's a lot of great wisdom that was Im imparted over the years, but no, but I, I know what you're saying. It's, it's, I mean, it has to be with, with just even before we went through what we've been through the last two years, the, the industry is, has been changing for some time and, and, you know, it's, it's evident and yeah, you, you, you gotta, you gotta go with those changes, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I had a couple other things I wanted to one of the things I was going to mention, I was going to ask you to float this idea to Craigie Zildjian and, uh, and Katie is next year is your 400th anniversary. Yes, sir. Right? Zildjian. Yep. Big, big anniversary, 400. And, and Vic's 60th. And Vic's 60th. That's right. Isn't that okay, crazy? Right. That's right. Cause it's my wife's 60th next year. Mm. Um, and I was just thinking we had this big, big party 20 years ago for the 380th right there in Norwell on the, tents and everything on the lawn my band will play <laughs> for, for what great deal for craigie's seen my band a couple of times debbie's seen us we'd be perfect i'm just i'm joe i'm just throwing the idea out there i, I am gonna write that down write it and, down um, grand theft audio will play at the zildjian 400th not for free no 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 how about a set of symbols and a brick, um, we, I'll throw a brick of sticks. In we can too. start with that. We can start with that. <laughs> Are you going to start having the gimmies? <laughs> uh, but Craigie knows how to reach me, okay. unless you're going to negotiate it. And, and I'm either way okay. or Katie. But All right. so I want to flip. I will let them know. I, I, okay. That might be a great idea. That's. Do you, are you guys thinking about anything? Yeah. Yeah. There's a, for the I, I don't want to say anything yet. I literally, we discussions have been going on and. There's a whole bunch of things floating in the air, but it's going to be pretty cool. Great. Um, cool. I think in the end, it should be a lot of, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be, it's going to be a busy year, man. I know. It's, yeah. There's well, a lot I'll, to do. Make, make sure, you know, I did move last year, so I'll make sure you guys have my new address for the invitation. <laughs> yes. I, I, I'm going to need that. I'll make sure you have that. And uh, <laughs> Therese DiMuzio is watching. 
by the way. Uh, Trace, Office. we love you too. Uh, um, and the other thing I was going to ask you is with NAM now pushed back to June, um, it, it's probably too, but you, will you guys kind of continue the tradition of having like new, are there any new products you can hint around about or is there you know, anything it, it, you can... A few years ago, before the COVID era, there was we had started moving the, the new releases dates to earlier in the year, and not so much NAM anymore. And I don't, I actually don't know if anybody releases new stuff. Well, I'm sure there are, but that that's not our goal. And it used to be NAMs when you release all your new yeah. stuff. We don't do that anymore. We're trying to do it earlier so that people actually get it in time to buy it for Christmas. You know, like yep, it's kind of like why well, I missed the boat. And then you can have the rest of the year to push it. So yeah. yeah, then the tie to NAM for new releases has been lost for years now. We we severed that tie. So there's uh there are some new things coming, but I don't think I'm I'm able to say anything about any of them. Yet. Okay. Yeah. So, no, I understand. But the concept shop has a lot of great stuff too. I don't know if you've seen any of that where you're seeing the that's a um it's exactly what it said. It's like a the test kitchen for for Zildjian, you know, where they'll all these great ideas come up all the time. And so they'll make these certain, they'll make only a hundred of them. Right. And then we'll just sell them. We'll put them out and see if, the, if people like them. And if they, if we sell enough of them and it, within a right amount of time, they'll be able, this is a good one. Let's release it to the, to the dealers. Cause what we're trying to do is avoid the, the era where you just came out with all this new product and shoved it on the retailer and said, now add this to your lineup. And they're like, man, I can't move what I can't, you know. So yeah. we're trying to yeah. test it and make sure that, okay, people, we're, there seems to be a good pulse on this one. If we give this to the dealers to sell, we're, we're, we're trying to give them the ability to be successful with it, you know. Like we kind yeah. of did a little testing other than we, obviously we do that with the artists too. But with the consumer too, because sometimes there's a, there's a lag there. Absolutely. Because no, the artists perfect. are way ahead of the curve, you know, a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so that that there's some cool stuff on the concept shop coming too. That's great. No, that's a great strategy. I mean, it makes it makes perfect sense to, um, you know, as you say, test these products and and you know, kind of get your maximum uh, benefit from them. You know, know yeah. See what the people be, are to get a finger yeah. on the pulse. You know what I mean? Get a feel. Wow. Well, Joe, we I'll tell you, you you are you are drawing the crowds today. Suzanne Morissette Cruz is watching. Andres Forio, Ferrero, um, Rich Mangicaro, who we were just talking about. Oh man, yeah, the love, cats. We need guy. to get the band back together. Another and go Mange. Rich is another Potsdam alumni. Yes, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, before me, way before me. Just make sure everyone's. <laughs> <laughs> he appreciates that yeah. <laughs> rich has got that fountain of youth look going though he does he does he's a handsome devil i got a great picture i i don't know if i could find it right now but maybe i'll post it that picture of you and and me and rich oh that's and a great one. McCarthy. Yeah, yeah that's i love that picture yeah um well man this is great joe this is this has been a lot of fun and um that's all i got right now anything <laughs> anything else you want to you want to talk about you want to you want to talk about your drumming career or yeah it's not it's that's <laughs> the amount of time we've talked about it is how it's going <laughs> <laughs> me too, me too. Uh, uh, oh no this this has been great buddy thank you so much for doing this oh man thanks for having me and i hope I, you know someone gets something out of it i knew we'd have a lot of laughs i think plenty of people if nothing else we may have embarrassed charlie drayton enough to get him to finally agree to do this with me so i would love that to see that, that seriously yeah me too me too the more people hear it from charlie i think the better the world will be i i mean that it's i i have to i have to say two quick things about charlie and maybe he's still watching but um years ago um billy amandola contacted me about interviewing charlie watts for modern drummer magazine i want to say it was might have been 10 years ago yeah and he asked Billy asked me to reach out to Charlie about doing it and have Charlie Drayton do the interview. And, and, and Charlie Watts's answer was because he didn't do interviews. He did not like to do them famously. He really asked Robin Flans about the interview she did with him 40 years ago. Wow. And, and Charlie, and what Charlie Watts said to me was if Charlie Drayton's doing it, then I'll do it. 
Like wow. if, if, if Charlie Drayton is going to interview me, I'll, I'll do it. And I just thought that was so beautiful because he loved, he loved Charlie so much. As that a says person. a lot. That says everything right there. Yeah. You know what I mean? As a, and so. as a musician. And then I remember Daryl Jones when first time Charlie Watts introduced me to Daryl, like, I don't know, 20 something years ago at a stone show. And, and Daryl wanted some symbols for his studio at home. And Charlie, you know, said to me, whatever it costs, just send me the bill. But just can you, can you, you know, take like ask Daryl what he wants and then just send me the bill. Don't tell him, you know. And I said, well, Charlie, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just give him the symbols. He's like, well, but I'm not asking you to do that. I'm not asking, but if, but if you, you know, if you, if you have to pay for them, then I'll pay for them. So I, I, uh, I get Daryl's phone number at a gig. And then I, he said, well, you know, call me or I'll, I'll call you when I get home and I'll see what I have or something. So anyway, my, the long story short is I'm talking with Daryl and he's giving me a list of the symbols that he wants. And it's basically exactly what Charlie Drayton plays. <laughs> and I said, you know, this is just what, this is like exactly what Charlie Drayton used. He said, well, I know. He said, if I were ever a drummer, I'd want to be Charlie Drayton. Well, so I just go. like, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. That's, that's awesome. And it, I actually got him to play Groove Night. That was like, that was tough, but I he know. did it. And it was amazing. It's going to cost me a lot of money to get Charlie Drayton, but I'm, it's worth it. I'll spend yeah, whatever it costs. Got to do it. All right. <laughs> Joe Testa, everybody. Big hand for my buddy, Joe Testa. Thank you, Johnny. AKA the Fonz. <laughs> Fonzie. Thank you, buddy. And right, uh, hang tight for one second and I'll, I'll end the stream and then we'll, uh, we'll say goodbye. All right. Thanks, Thanks for watching. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you for sure on the 12th with Ainsley Dunbar at 1 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, maybe before then, but for sure, I'll see you on Saturday, February 12th with Ainsley Dunbar. Thanks for watching, everybody. Awesome. We'll see you soon.